Hi, my name is Konika Klanis and you're watching the video HES Screen, Principles and Method of Assessment. In this video, we'll be doing just that. We'll be discussing the principles of the HES Screen and also how to go about assessing a patient utilising the HES Screen. When do we use a HES Screen? Essentially, it's utilised when a patient has an incommodant strabismus, so where there might be a mechanical restriction or a neurogenic palsy. We would like to utilise the HES chart to map the underactions and overactions that we're observing on ocular movements. It also provides a permanent accurate record of ocular movements. So whilst um, ocular movements itself can indicate that you have a superior oblique underaction and a inferior oblique overaction, for instance, there's some subjectivity to the grading of those particular underactions and overactions. And between visits, it's at times difficult to determine if there has been any improvement or not. So with the HES chart, the recording is more accurate and the comparison between visits is therefore more accurate. So the HES screen consists of a tangent screen which is used to map the relative positions of the eyes in nine positions. And here we have a patient who is sitting in front of a tangent screen. Now I'll take you through what that tangent screen looks like but in essence the chart includes horizontal and vertical lines that subtend a visual angle of five degrees. Now in order for the patient to perform this test they need to be wearing red green goggles and we need red green torches. One will be held by the patient and one will be held by the examiner. More recent versions of the HES chart actually include LED lights and these are red lights and so the patient, sorry, the examiner is in control of the red light at all times. As we discuss the HES chart in this particular video, I will be assuming that the examiner is in control of the red light. Okay, so this is what the patient is seeing. This is the tangent screen. And what we can see is a series of horizontal lines and vertical lines and some specific target points in those circles and diamonds. Now to start off with, it's important to note that that central dot is the central fixation target and represents primary position. So it's important that the patient's eyes are in alignment with that particular dot. If, for instance, your patient was too low, as the patient is looking at that dot, you would actually end up measuring elevation. So it's very important that their eyes are in alignment with that dot. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, the lines subtend an angle of five degrees. This means that each square equals five degrees. So if you look at the first dots that we see, we have five degrees here, another five degrees here, and another five degrees here. That means we're assessing the patient in 15 degrees elevation in this particular instance. So indeed, that inner field represents 15 degrees. If we look at the outer field, we can see that we have an additional 15 degrees, five, 10, 15 degrees that we're assessing the patient in. So in this instance, when we're looking at the outer field, this represents 30 degrees. So in general, we will assess patients in 15 degrees and where appropriate, we'll also assess them in 30 degrees. So the way we go about assessing the patient using the HES screen test is such that the orthoptist will shine a light at each of these points. Generally, the orthoptist will shine the red light and the patient will ask, or well, the patient will be asked to superimpose their green light on top of the examiner's red light. We'll talk about this further in a moment. To further explain the HES screen, let's assume that you're assessing the patient's right eye. In this instance, what we would be assessing is the deviation in prior position here, when we ask the patient to superimpose their light in the prior position. When we move over to here, we are moving the patient 15 degrees into left gaze. Up here, we're moving the patient 15 degrees into LAVO elevation. And here we're moving the patient 15 degrees into LAVO depression. Okay, on the opposite side, we've got here, we've moved the patient into dextroversion 
dextral elevation, dextro depression. And here we move the patient in direct elevation and direct depression. So the only difference with the outer field is that we're just moving the patient in direct elevation here by 30 degrees and here in LAVO elevation by 30 degrees and so on. So you can see that what we're doing is we're moving the patient in nine positions of gaze, either in the 15 degree inner field or in the 30 degree outer field and measuring the deviation in each of those positions. In doing so, we're able to map overactions and underactions. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, the patient needs to be wearing red, green goggles. The reason we do this is so that one eye sees the light from one torch and the other eye sees the light from the other torch. So obviously the red, the eye under the red goggle will see the red light and the eye under the green goggle will see the green light. Now, when the red light is controlled by the examiner, which is the gold standard, the eye under the red goggle will act as the fixing eye. And as such, you'll be measuring the deviation of the eye under the green goggle. This is considered the indicator eye. And as mentioned earlier, the patient will be asked to superimpose the green light over the red light. This will give you the size of the deviation. Let's talk about the principle that is being utilised here. So the grey line here represents the HES chart and I've given you an example of a patient with a left esotropia. Now the orthoptist will present the red light to the patient and let's assume this is prior position for the moment. That red light will be seen by the right eye which is the fixing eye in this instance. And because it's the fixing eye, the patient will see that, that red light in primary position. Now, you're going to ask the patient to put their green light on top of the red light. However, this left eye, which is the indicator eye in this instance, is, has an esotropia. This means that in order for the green light to be on top of the red light, the green light will need to be placed to the right of the target. Now it's important to note that because the HES chart relies on the principle of foveal projection, what you end up mapping will actually represent the position of the eye. Keep that in mind and I'll come back to this in a moment. Given the principles of this test, there are a few requirements in order to be able to perform this examination on a patient. Firstly, the patient must have normal retinal correspondence. Because you're relying on the subjective angle, what will happen is that if the patient has ARC, the measurement of the deviation will be incorrect. The patient must also have no suppression. So if they had suppression, obviously they would not be able to see one of the lights to be able to superimpose it on top of the other. They can have slight amount of suppression and in this instance um, what can happen is the dissociation of the red-green goggles can sometimes be enough to break the suppression and allow you to perform the test. So in instances where there is suppression you might want to have a quick go to see whether the patient is able to perceive both the red and the green light. However, be aware that this is a limitation of the test. And of course, if your patient has a red cream colour blindness, this can present an issue in relation to uh, plotting the ocular movements. In terms of the physical requirements, the patient needs to be 50 centimetres from the chart. And orthoptists often utilise the RAF gauge as an indicator of the 50 centimetres. As I mentioned earlier, you will have to adjust the chair or the screen, depending on whether you have control of the screen so that the patient's eyes are level with that central target. Now, where possible, it's great to have the patient having their chin and forehead on a rest. This is because you have to have no movement of the head during testing. If you don't have a headrest, then you can try and hold the patient's head or at least make sure that they're not moving their head during testing. The test is also performed with the room lights dimmed or with the lights off, so make sure that you do that before you commence plotting the HES chart. 
Before you commence the test, you should explain it to the patient before they put the goggles on. So show them what you're asking them to do, that, they, that you want them to superimpose the green light on the red light so that they're aware of the requirements before they commence. Now what you will do is you'll, you'll actually plot the HES chart twice. You will do this fixing right eye and fixing left eye. You will do all positions of gaze. So you will assess the deviation in primary, dextroversion, dextro elevation, dextro depression, etc. So all nine positions need to be assessed and generally you will always assess the inner 15 degree field and then the option is whether you also assess the 30 degree field. When plotting the deviation, it's best that you utilise a systematic approach and that you always plot the deviation of one eye before the other. And it's recommended that you plot the left eye first and then the right eye. This means that you plot the right eye fixing first, so the red goggle in front of the right eye. So when the patient is fixing right, remember you're plotting that left eye, the red goggle is in front of the right eye, the green goggle is in front of the left. You'll then proceed to swapping the goggles over and having the green light in front, sorry, the green goggle in front of the right eye, red goggle in front of left eye. Now you'll be measuring the right eye or plotting the right eye. So the left eye will be the fixing eye and the right eye will be the indicator eye. Here we have the recording sheet for the HES screen test and we see that we've got two HES screen charts so that we can plot each eye. The one over here to the right is representative of the right eye as indicated on the recording sheet. And assuming that the examiner is in control of the red light, the goggles for the patient would have been such that the red, would, the red goggle would be before the left eye and the green goggle would be before the right eye. Over here now we have the chart for the left eye, again, as indicated on the chart. And in terms of the goggles for the patient, the red goggle would be before the right eye and the green goggle before the left eye. I'll briefly demonstrate to you how we go about plotting the eye movements. So let's say we're plotting the right eye. What will happen first is the orthoptist will present the red light in prime position. The patient will be asked to superimpose their green light on top of the red light. Let's say that this is where the patient thinks that the green light is on top of the red one. If this is the case, we would actually mark that point on this recording sheet. The orthoptist then moves to another position of gaze. Let's go over here into a deduction and ask the patient again to put their green light on top of the red light. Let's assume that that's where they think they are superimposed. You plot that on the HES chart. Let's now move into elevation, ask the patient to superimpose their green light onto this light and they think it's over here. And let's just do depression as well and here that's where they think there is superimposition of the two lights. Okay so in the end what you will have done is plotted all nine positions of gaze and then you'll actually join the dots so to speak so that you can have a map of these ocular movements. I began plotting here the 15 degree inner field and as I mentioned earlier, you could also plot the 30 degree uh, outer field if you so need to. The 30 degree outer field is usually required if you have very subtle underactions and overactions, in which case taking them out into more extreme gaze is a good idea so that you can pick up those smaller underactions and overactions. Okay, here is an example of a completed HES chart where we have the plotting of the right eye, the plotting of the left eye, and we can observe underactions and overactions, etc. I'll take you through how to interpret this chart in another video. Now, I recall earlier that I mentioned that the HES chart relies on foveal projection, and that because of this, what you're plotting is actually indeed the deviation. What I meant by this is here we have the plotting of the right eye. When the patient was asked to superimpose the light in prior position, they have indicated that the light is superimposed in this position. 
This indicates that the eye is actually up. There is a hyper deviation of the right eye. The reason I bring this to your attention is that it's very different to other tests that you've learned about in the past. So say for instance, when we talk about um, worst four lights, we talk about if the image is up, the eye is down. This is not the case for the Hess chart because it's foveal projection. The reason why the worst four lights is such that if the image is up, the eye is down, is because the image is being projected from the inferior retina. In this instance with the Hess chart, it's not an inferior retina resulting in the image being higher, it is simply foveal projection. This is a summary slide for you to just highlight what I've just discussed. However, I will bring your attention to what to record in addition to your mapping of your ocular movements. Always remember that your HES chart, because it's a loose sheet of paper and has to be put into a history, you must always remember to put the patient's name, the date, a UR number if, um, if they're part of a hospital system, and if appropriate, if you're uh, repeating these HES charts to indicate what number HES chart is in the series. So number one would be the first HES chart you perform on this patient. The second time you perform the test, it would be number two and so on and so on. And therefore what you can do is map out and have a look at the change in the ocular movements over time. In summary, the HES chart is based on the principle of foveal projection. And by dissociating the patients using red-green goggles, we're able to map the ocular movements of each eye. We map the left eye whilst the right eye is fixing, and we map the right eye whilst the left eye is fixing. Now, when performing the hair screen test, it's important that you develop a systematic approach to this investigation. I suggest that the uh, examiner is always in control of the red light, and that you commence by plotting the left eye by having the red goggle in front of the right eye. You then proceed to map the right eye and swap the goggles over so that the red goggle is in front of the left eye. If you create a systematic approach to your assessment of HES charts, you will always plot correctly and reduce the chance of misdiagnosis. Finally, use the HES chart recording sheet to record your results. Record or plot the exact point at which the patient perceives the superimposition of the lights. And once you've completed all nine positions of gaze, you will need to connect those dots so that you have a complete map of the ocular movements of each eye. Okay, that brings us to the conclusion of this video. Thank you for watching.